Well, good morning, Resurrection. We're so glad that you could join us this week. I uh, hope you've had a great week. Just a couple of announcements before we get started this morning. The words to the songs and the prayers will be on the screen as we go along. Also, just a reminder, we have the outside service each Sunday, 9 o'clock in the Memorial Garden, so feel free to join us for that. And then this week on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, there's two opportunities. There's Wednesday at noon, if you're able to break away and come by, there'll be an outside service uh, here in the Memorial Garden. If you can't come at noon, at 6.30, there'll be a drive-up opportunity. Pastor Marge will be out there, and uh, we'll do the imposition of ashes then. And then there'll also be an online option for that as well. And then one other thing, the stewardship committee is looking for people. So if you are interested in those things and would love to, uh, to be a part of that, let the church office know, let Sherry know. Uh, we'd love to have you uh, join in with that as well. Well, before we get going this morning, 1 John 4, 4 says, Little children, you are from God and have conquered them, for the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Let's worship together this morning.
splendor of the king clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice all the earth rejoice he wraps himself in light and darkness tries to hide trembles at his voice trembles at his voice how great is our god sing with me how great is our god and all will see how great how great Beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God? Sing with me, how great is our God? Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. How great, how great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And oh, all we'll see how great, how great is our God. once again, Resurrection, and thank you so much for joining us in worship this morning. So glad that you're able to be with us wherever you are. Hopefully you're singing along, following the words on your screen, and worshiping with us this morning. Before we continue in the worship, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this privilege and opportunity to sing praises into your name. What an awesome honor it is to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray for our brothers and sisters who can't be with us in person, that you would bless them spiritually wherever they are. For those who are less fortunate than us, maybe with sickness, that you would give healing. For those who perhaps have a death in their home, that you would give comfort during this time of grief. Be with us through the remaining parts of the service, and may we receive a blessing from the sermon that Pastor Marge will bring a little bit later on. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, as we continue this morning, this song is called The Creed, This I Believe. Normally, we profess our faith by saying the creed, but this morning, let's sing it together. So wherever you are, lift your voices as we profess our faith as we sing the creed. Resurrection. 
resurrection that we will rise again for i believe in the name of Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses who were walking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with him anymore but only Jesus. And they were coming down the mountain. He ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. There's an old story about a man who had problems with bats in the attic. No matter what he did, he couldn't get rid of them. He called exterminator after exterminator, but the bats always came back to his attic. Finally, in desperation, not knowing what else to do, he called the pastor. The pastor listened carefully to the man's problem and said, 
I know just the thing. The pastor went up to the attic and came back down 30 minutes later. You won't have a problem with those bats again, said the pastor. And sure enough, the man never saw another bat in his attic. Months later, the man ran into the pastor and said, how did you do it? How did you keep those bats from ever coming back to my house? Well, the pastor smiled sadly and said, it was simple. I baptized them and confirmed them. After confirmation, they never come back. You know, that story might be funny if it weren't so close to the truth. Somehow, many of us in the mainline church got the idea that confirmation is the pinnacle of Christian education and spiritual growth. In fact, most of our confirmation services look very much like a graduation service. And I don't know about you, but once I graduated, the next time that I returned to school was for my 10-year reunion. And if you think that I'm overstating my case, consider this. Several years ago, the Search Institute's research showed that 80% of the kids leave the church after confirmation, as do 75% of their parents. Another study of the Lutherans discovered that just over 2% of adults who are active in the church were involved in any kind of organized Bible study. I believe that God has so much more in store for us than we seem willing to embrace. Our discipleship, our growth, as followers of Jesus, it's a lifelong process. In baptism, we were born again into the life of Christ. And we get to spend the rest of our lives, not just the first 13 years of growing up and growing into the likeness of Jesus. That's what the seasons of discipleship are all about the reality of this lifelong journey of growing as followers of Jesus. This morning, I'd like to show you what these seasons of discipleship might look like in the various seasons of your life. So let me introduce you to a few disciples who are on the journey. Story one, planting seeds and taking root. It is a myth that all seniors spend their latter years growing and bearing fruit. They actually faith, they actually face some major faith issues. For example, those ages of 65 to 74, they wonder about their vocation or what to do with the rest of their life after retirement. Seniors, ages 75 to 84, they are asking questions about death and eternal life. And those 86 and older, they're wondering about suffering. With these faith questions come many opportunities for seniors to grow and to bear fruit. But there are also seniors who are in the planting and taking root seasons of discipleship. I'd like to introduce you to George. George lived in a nursing home where we brought some middle school students to participate in vacation Bible school. He had made it very clear to the nursing home's chaplain that he hadn't had anything to do with, with church since he was a child, and he really wasn't interested in any God talk. However, when he heard that the kids were coming for three days, he wanted to participate. And as the week went along, George shared his life story with these young VBSers and participated in the activities. On the final day, I observed him 
at the worship service and he's saying, Jesus loves me. He received communion and he prayed the Lord's prayer with us. Most remarkably, after the VBSers, George attended the worship services and the Bible studies that the nursing home offered, and he was open to talking with the chaplain about his faith. A young middle school student planted the seeds of discipleship into the life of this senior who then became rooted in the faith and lived out his last three months of his life being thankful and a contented man. When he died, his daughter expressed her appreciation for the VBS kids, acceptance of her father, and simply loving him as he was, just as God did. Story two taking root and growing. Now I like to look at my faith as a dance. I have the knowledge that there is still more to be learned and improved upon and yet I already know the basic steps and techniques. The beginnings of this dance are deeply rooted in the faith that I was taught as a child from my family and as a young adult in church. Each step was carefully taught to me through word and action. Through there came a time when I began to explore new movements on my own to discover what this faith was all about. Looking back, there were a lot of people who didn't even realize that they taught me about faith and formed my faith and what that really meant for my life. It took a while for me to discover the many ways that my faith thrives and grows. The greatest of these is simply to be surrounded by people that challenge me. People who remind me of who God created me to be, speaking truth in my life and allowing me to do the same for them. Secondly, I find that studying theology and scripture are ways that I discover greater meaning in my life as God's revelation unfolds through God's word. Even through every new movement learned, I hold on to the roots from my childhood because they are what gives me the freedom to explore beyond my understanding. Story three, growing and bearing fruit. When I think of the movement from one season to the next, from the season of taking root to growing deeper, I cannot help but think of Terry Gallagher. I've known Terry for a number of years, and in that time I have talked, I have prayed, and I've studied and read with him. He's a committed follower of Christ now, but he wasn't always. Here is his remarkable story. I know God accepted me into God's family when I was baptized as an infant, but as an adult, I chose to distance myself from God's family. I thought I could live life on my own, independently, and didn't really need God. I also didn't spend much time thinking about it. And as I got older, I lived, lived life my way. And it slowly became more and more meaningless and empty. I didn't feel like I was accomplishing anything. I felt unimportant, and I had lost my direction and purpose. All of that had very negative impact on the people that I loved most, my family. I began to realize that I was driving myself away from them emotionally and making poor choices to help forget where I was. When I was at my lowest point, wondering why I was even here, without my even realizing it, God started working through my daughter and my wife and my friends to let me know that God hadn't abandoned me. 
and that I was always welcomed back into the family. From the loving support of my wife to watching my daughter come to accept Christ, to to having friends recommend books to read and just talking with me, I realized that something was stirring inside me. So I started to listen, learn, contemplate what this all meant. I also started, started to talk to God regularly. And the more I talked with God, and the more I actually listened, the clearer it became to me that God did, did have a purpose for my being here. So on a cold January morning, five years ago from my heart, I asked God for forgiveness and told him, I'm giving my life to you for your purpose. Please help me understand what that purpose is. He said, I started coming to St. Mark's right after that and started immediately finding ways to serve, which allowed me to grow. In the last five years, St. Mark's has been instrumental in my spiritual journey by teaching, encouraging, and allowing me to serve in ways that I couldn't have imagined. All of that keeps the fire going and growing. I was commissioned as a spiritual care minister in December of 2015, and I have served on the leadership team since then. As part of the spiritual care team, I have regular visits with individuals. I do hospital visits as needed, participate in different services, anointing and prayers, remembrances. I have been on the weekend pastor on call rotation since April of 2017, and currently I'm called once a month. I serve on Pastor Taylor's adult learning leadership team, which worked on a Sunday forum series. I've also served with Pastor Taylor in various ways over the last few years, helping out with new discipleship for a time, helping with the men's retreat and any other things he may need. My wife and I volunteer at the food pantry once a month. I led a small group during the uh, past Lenten season and participated in a men's Bible study weekly on Saturdays. I also serve on the worship team every now and then when he needs a backup guitar player. Through all of the learning and growing, I realize that everything comes down to relationships and how I choose to foster them. Whether it is at home, at work, or at church, or out in the community, I work to have every aspect of my life reflect the heart that God has placed within me. The heart is visible in how I relate, how I treat those with whom I come in contact every day. My passion is to help, to encourage others' experiences, their connection with God. What can be more powerful than my words is how I treat those with whom I come in contact. The guidance I get from praying, reading scripture, attending worship, as well as giving of myself and my resources helps direct how I respond to life and those around me. Story four, lying fallow. The seasons of discipleship affect disciples of all ages. Meet Matt. Matt was a good kid. He had great parents, a loving family, He was baptized at 13 days old, and he attended his parents' small group, even as an infant. He started Sunday school early, and he rarely missed a weekend worship service, and he breathed through confirmation. He grew in faith, and he truly lived into his baptismal promises. But there came a time when something happened inside of him. Maybe it was normal teenage rebellion. Maybe it was the confusion of all the changes that happened during puberty. For whatever reason, Matt's faith started to feel different. There wasn't that spark. 
There wasn't that assurance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. He still believed. And he knew that Jesus was his loving savior. But he felt he was moving into a new season of life. He was moving into a fallow season. Matt's season started when he talked to his pastor about not being confirmed. He felt he was moving into a fallow season. Matt's season started when he talked to his pastor about not being confirmed. He felt he simply wasn't ready. And his pastor blessed him to continue on his journey of faith and not be confirmed yet. Matt spent the years of his high school life seeking God, but not really plugged into the youth group at the church. After graduation, he took some time off before going to college, and he took a job at Holden Village doing whatever was necessary and seeking little or no pay. It was here that Jesus came to Matt and rekindled his faith. It's not that Matt ever stopped believing. He simply took some time to restore and refresh his faith in Christ. Like land that has to be worked, has produced crops for years. At some point, that land needs to rest and be restored so that it can be productive again. That's lying fallow. Matt needed to lie fallow so that he could be productive again. So like the farmer, working the land to help spring to life, Jesus worked on Matt's heart and helped him spring back to life too. Matt emailed his pastor and asked if he was around if Matt would uh, happen to stop by. It was years since his pastor had heard from Matt. They made arrangements to meet, and when they did, they greeted each other with a great big hug and smiles and stretched that stretch from ear to ear. That's when Matt dropped the bomb. Pastor, he said, I think I'm ready to be confirmed. Would you do the honors? No matter what season of life you're in, I want to challenge you to consider what season of discipleship that you are in today. You may be here today in need of having the seeds of the gospel planted in your soul. Or perhaps you're in the season of taking root, being reminded of learning for the first time the basics of the faith. Or maybe you're in the season of growing, a time in which God's spirit is, is stretching and changing in you in ways that you never could have imagined. Or you might be in the season of bearing fruit, so filled with the love and joy of Jesus that you can't help but share that love and joy with others in practical, tangible ways. Or perhaps you're in the season of fallow, tired and broken by the hardships of life, and you need of God's restoring grace to bring you back to wholeness. What season of discipleship are you in today? From the stories that you have just heard, I hope that you have come to see that this is not a linear journey. One in which that we take root in our teens and grow in our 20s and bear fruit for the rest of our lives. And I also hope that you note that you've come to see that many of us are in more than one season at a time. While the, while the seasons of discipleship provides a framework for understanding our growth as disciples, this process, it is still a wonderful mystery. And I want to invite you to get engaged in the journey, in the mystery. God has called us to be and to make disciples, not because we have to, but because we get to.
For the upcoming months of our lives together, we're going to, it's going to revolve around taking root. We're going to explore the foundation, the roots of our Christian faith. And then we're going to enter into the season of growing as we read through the New Testament together. I want to encourage you. I want to urge you to join me on that journey. See, God loves you just the way you are. But God loves you far too much to leave you that way. Amen. He's all I need when I just need someone to talk to. He's always there to hear my prayer. Every time I call him, all my needs, he will supply my thirsty soul he satisfies he is the Lord of all and he is all I need he comforts me when I'm weary Every pain feels my deepest longing time and time again. He's my soul's inspiration, my heart's consolation. Everything he's all I need. He's all I need. I'll dare not turn to any other. Oh no, my Lord's a friend. That promised he'd stay closer than any of my brothers. And on this friend, I can always rely. He'll be my strength as life goes by. Let's sing it one more time. He's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus.
Jesus is all I need. Oh, He's the Lord of all, and I know He's all I'll ever need. And now I invite you to join me and to pray as the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please join me for our spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you in my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Before I give you the final benediction, the final word, I want to invite you to our Ash Wednesday service this coming Wednesday at noon. It'll be held outdoors. We will share communion and have the imposition of ashes. If you're not able to take off and uh, on your lunch hour and come and join us, then I invite you to come at 6.30 where it'll be a drive-by imposition of ashes. And now, God the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, give you peace. Amen. And from all of us, we want to thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. Happy Valentine's Day, and we hope you have a great week.